back out of the call. All right, so this goes over what we talked about on the previous webinar. So let's talk about what we're going to go over today. Today, we're going to talk about, we're going to go back over data entry so that you're comfortable adding basic data to your sheet. I'm going to review some data entry rules to kind of keep in mind so your data stays nice and organized. And then we're going to dive right into formulas and functions. So we're going to go over some basic formulas, some basic functions, and how you enter those. And then we'll go on to sorting and filtering your data, as well as bringing in charts. And then I do want to take the final few minutes just to review the sharing options in Google again. Um, those sharing options are nice to work live and collaboratively, so I want to make sure we have access to those in Google. And then we will open up for a Q&A. Um, this is going to be a lot of information in about 35 to 40 minutes, um, maybe 45 minutes. So definitely take notes, um, sit back, absorb as much as you can. And then either sometime today or tomorrow, I will send you a follow up email with this recording as well as the slide deck that I used. So you will have access to the resources that we are going over today. So don't feel like you're going to just be left high and dry. You will get some follow up resources for this. Okay, so just as quick review, let's review the layout of a Google Sheet. So I'm assuming here because you've taken the previous Google webinar, you know how to get into your Google Drive and start a Google Sheet or a Google Doc. So let's review the layout really quickly of what we're looking at. So when we start a brand new sheet, this is what it looks like. And as a reminder, the first thing that we need to do anytime we make something new in Google is we need to give it a title. So you just click on the untitled spreadsheet up there and give it a title. Below the title are your different menus, and we're going to look at a couple of those menus today. And then below the menus are is the toolbar, and the toolbar has some quick formatting options as well as some quick inserting options. So these are the most commonly used tools by various users, and they're quickly accessible here in the toolbar. At the very bottom of the page there on the right left hand side, you have the different sheets that are going to be listed for you. Um, each Google Doc starts with one sheet, but you can add additional sheets, and that is like adding additional pages to your document. And then once we move on to the sheet itself, sheets are organized by columns and by rows. And as a quick reminder, columns are always lettered with the alphabet, and rows are always numbered with numbers. Where those intersect are cells, and each cell has its own unique content, which makes doing formulas and calculations really easy within Google Sheets. Just as a quick reminder, the current cell that you are on will always be outlined in blue. And we went over in the previous webinar the explore button and the share button. We will touch back on the share button here at the very end. Uh, I apologize if this seems like re repeating information. I just want to make sure that we have a baseline of what we're working with as we dive into some of the other topics in this particular webinar. So let's talk about data entry because that's what you do with a spreadsheet is it's a great place to keep data and then do analytics on your data later. So as a reminder, it's really easy to enter data. Each cell gets its own unique piece of data and that can be numbers that can be letters that can be whole strings of sentences if you want. But essentially to enter data into a cell, you are going to click on that cell and start typing out the data you want captured in that cell. Again, each cell has its own set of data. So that's something you need to keep in mind. So here on cell C1, I've entered the number three there. Couple of navigation tips. If I'm entering data and I need to move to the right one cell, I can click tab. If I need to move down one row, I can click enter to move down. So there's a couple quick keyboard shortcuts to allow for more rapid data entry. And then as just another reminder, each cell does have its own content. Um, and those might not fully show depending on the width and height of your cells. So you can't always look in the address bar to see that full content. So in this picture here that just popped up, when we look at cell E22, the blue box, we see Fred Smith and Kay. But when we look where my number three is there, we see Fred Smith and Kimberly Van Horn. That there is the address box that will let you see the full contents of the cell, uh, regardless of what's actually present. And we're going to look back at that address box in a little bit when we start talking about formulas. One quick reminder on organizing your data. The more granular you can be with the organization, the better. It is always easier to combine data later than it is to separate it out. 
and you want to get really granular with it and you want to organize it by column. So each type of information should have its own column and then each log or each you know, person in this sample here would have their own row. So in the little sample that popped up in this box here, we're doing last name, first name, student ID. We could then collect grade level, date of birth, teacher, all of that. And each student would get their own row with each cell getting one piece of that granular information. Again, if I need to combine this later, that's going to be easier to do, the better organized this is here. So let's take a look at the sample spreadsheet here, and I'm going to be working off of this sample spreadsheet for most of the examples I give you. So here I have a set of data, and there's a couple things I want to highlight about this data. So the first thing is, is the data is entered really well. I've got really granular information here, and they took the time to format each of these numbers here. So my dates are formatted in one way, my item numbers are formatted as plain numbers, my amounts are formatted with decimals, my prices are formatted with numbers, my percentages are formatted with percentages, and then I do have some text there at the very end. So they took the time to really organize this data well, and they took the time to format the numbers visually so I know right away what I'm looking at. Additionally, they added really clear distinct headers for each of these columns here so that I know in column A I need to put the date and in column B I need to put the SKU and in column C I need to put the amounts and column D I need to put the prices so on and so forth so again each piece of data is organized by column and each column only has one type of information in it I also like that they made their headers stylistically a little bit different so you can see they added a little bit of a cell fill there of the light orange color and they also bolded the headers so that I knew visually that this information was labeling the information below it and it wasn't a part of it. And we already talked about the, uh, the sorry, the number formatting there, but that's again what that's highlighting is they took the time to format the numbers visually so we knew what we were looking at. And then finally, this does have a title. In this case, it's just my sample data set. I would normally want a more clear title, but I like that this has a title. So this is a good data set to work with. It's organized really well. It's formatted well and my information is sorted by column, which is how I need it. So let's dive into first, we're going to talk about freezing. This is a small little tool, but this is helpful. As this data set grows larger and larger, if I keep scrolling, my top row there with my um, header information might get lost. So I might have to scroll up to see, okay, item SKU goes in column B and then scroll down to enter it as my data gets really large. So freezing allows me to lock a row or a column in place so that as I move around the rest of my spreadsheet, that row and column is all, or column is always visible. It doesn't lock the content of that necessarily. It just means it's locked in place visually. So I always see those labels wherever I am on the sheet. So to freeze an item, I can go into the view menu. I can click on freeze. And once I click on freeze, this menu here is going to pop up here and it's going to ask me what I want to freeze. So typically I would want to freeze at least the top row, maybe the top two rows, depending on how they're formatted. I might also need to freeze the very first column if that column has name information and I need to remember what name I'm entering. So basically here you just pick what you want to freeze and you can freeze multiple things if you need to. So I could come in here and I could click freeze one row and I could come in here and click freeze one column as well. You'll also notice it has the option up to current row. So you can click on any given cell in a row and a column, and you can freeze up to that cell as well. I find that that's a little bit less common, but it is definitely helpful usually to freeze the first row and sometimes the first column, depending on your information. Again, this doesn't lock that information for editing. It just means that you can see it um, a little bit easier. All right, so that's just kind of another navigation tip for you to make keeping track of large amounts of data easier. So let's dive into some basic calculations that we can do in Google Sheets now. So in this case, we're going to initially talk about just basic formulas, addition, multiplication, division, all of that. So to build a formula, you're going to first click in the cell that you want the formula to go in. So in this example here, I'm on cell E, we'll say E1, but I cut off my row there, so I'm not totally sure. 
I'm in cell or sorry, E2. I'm in cell E2 and in cell E2, I want to find out the order total. And so to find out the order total, I need to multiply my amount of product by the product price. So I could go in and I could say, you know, I could pull up my calculator and I could calculate seven times 1290 is $90 and 30 cents. However, I want Google Sheets to do this for me. So anytime I'm starting with a formula in Google Sheets or in Excel, this is a completely transferable skill. I always I kind of build the formula backwards almost. I always start with my equal sign first. So in that cell E2, the very first thing I type is equals because I this is a Google Sheets notification that I'm running a formula or a calculation. Now I could do equals and I could type out seven times and then 12.9 um, to get the answer there. But what I'm doing instead is I'm actually clicking on the cell or typing out the cell name that I want to multiply. So in this case, I did equals and then I clicked on or typed out C2. So it outlined in orange there. And then between after C2, I entered the operator. So the operator is what mathematical operation I want to run, whether that's multiplication or addition, subtraction, all of that. And then, so I type out C2, I type the operator, and then I enter D2, or I click on cell D2, so it outlines in purple there. So I get a really nice visual here of what's happening. So I've got my equal sign, I've got my orange cell C2, I'm multiplying it, so I've got the asterisk there, times D2. And then once I'm ready with, to run this formula, I can hit enter or tab, and that will run the formula for me. However, this is something nice that Google does that Excel doesn't do. Google is going to give me this little tiny pop up here to let me know what the answer is going to be before I even run the formula so I can make sure that mentally that makes sense and I'm doing the right calculation. In this case, this is a pretty basic formula, so this makes sense to me. And then this here, this little pop up table is your little guide to what keyboard um, keys equal which operation. So the plus key is going to be your addition. The minus key or the dash key is going to be your subtraction. Your asterisk will be multiplication. Your slash there will be division. And then if you want to do any exponential calculations, you know, two squared, three squared, all of that, you can use the caret, which is located above the number six, to do any exponent calculations. And those there you would enter on step three, you would enter where your operator is and you would just enter those various keys to run that particular operation. So if I wanted to instead add the amount plus the price, I would do a plus. So I do equals C2 plus D2. So I'm going to put a question out there for you just to kind of see if you understand why we're using these cell names as opposed to the numbers itself. So if you think you know the answer, go ahead and type that out in the chat really quickly. Why would we use the cell name rather than the number in the cell? So why am I taking the time to type out cell C2 instead of seven? I'll give you like 30 more seconds. There's a couple good answers coming in, but I wanna give everyone a chance to, to kind of think about why we might want to do this cell name. Okay, I like some of the answers that are coming in. So Pete Rogers mentioned that it's dynamic. Um, which is true. And then Abigail kind of built on that. It's, she was, went on to say you're creating a formula and the idea is that formula can be copied. So there's a couple different things here that we that make this building it based on the cell name a little bit helpful. So if we back up here to my basic formula slide here. So here I've got the amount times the price. And if I went in and I just said equals seven times 1290, that's a fixed number. It's not talking to any cells or referencing any cells. When instead I type out C2 and D2, those are cell references. Um, that means that this is actually pulling the number directly from the cell. So if something happens and inflation hits and prices go up, 
I can go in and I can change my price there in D2, and that will update the total of my formula. So I don't need to go in and recalculate my formula, which as Lisa's pointing out here, could be very tedious. Um, I don't need to recalculate my formula. I just update my price. And because the formula is linked to that price, it's automatically updating. So that means I just change information once and every formula that is referenced to that cell will update automatically. So that's anytime you can use that cell name as opposed to a fixed number, because that's going to make going in and updating your formulas a lot easier. And then kind of to bring up Abigail's next point is it's really easy to copy a formula that's set up this way too, because we're not doing a fixed calculation. We're doing a cell reference. So to copy a formula, in this case here, I want to copy my order total formula down the rest of the column. I first click on the cell that contains the formula that I just built. So in this case, I'm clicking on cell E2 because we just built the formula here in cell E2. Once I click on that, there's a teeny tiny little blue box in the very bottom corner of that cell. If I click on that cell and hold and drag down, all the way down to where my number three is, that is going to copy that formula all the way down the line. However, it's going to be it's going to be a dynamic copy because we use cell references. So where it says, oops, sorry, where it says C2 times D2, when I move it from row two to row three, it'll now say C3 times D3. So it becomes a dynamic copy. So each line gets its own formula that references the numbers on that line as opposed to the numbers up above. So this is a really easy way, instead of having to type out 20 some odd formulas there, I type out one formula, I drag it down, and that formula copies, and it pulls the relevant calculations from that line. So I don't have to redo those formulas. So I just let go, and boom, all my calculations are done for me. So it's really easy to copy a formula. If you do that in Excel, it's the same function here in Google Sheets. All right, we're going to move on to functions. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of two functions. However, there are over 300 functions in Google Sheets. So we're going to talk a little bit more just about how functions work in general and give you an idea of a simple function and a slightly more complicated function. So to insert a function, functions tend to be a little bit more complex than this plus that or this times that. You certainly could do the um, addition of a large amount of things with a function as well. And you can also do different things like averages. You can find the min, the max, all of that stuff. So to enter a function, your first step is the same as a formula. You first click on the cell that you want to add a function to. And then if you happen to already know the function name, you could type out your equal sign and you could start typing the name of the function. However, I'm going to show you where to find all the functions so that you can bring them in that way too. So step one, you click on the cell where you want the function, and then you're going to go into your insert menu to find all of your functions. In the insert menu, you then find function listed there. Um, there's also a function icon on the toolbar that you can use as well. And then when you click on function, you have some different options. The top five options there are the five most commonly used functions. So sum, average, count, minimum, maximum, things like that. So you can use just these five right here. They're always going to be ready to go for you. If you need a more particular function, you can look in the different menus here, um, all array database. These are other functions grouped by um, function type. So if you're looking for some mathematical functions, you might need to go into the math area to look up all the different mathematical functions. If you're not sure where your function fits in this categorization, you can look at all. Um, Google also has a help box that you can type in the name of the function and help, and they can help you with that as well. So in this case here, in my example, we're going to use the average function. I believe, yeah, we're going to use the average function because I want to find the average price of my orders. So I went into insert. So first, I'm sorry, backing up, I went to the very bottom of my E column there, and I selected the cell I wanted to put my function in. I went into insert, I went into function, and I picked average. Once I pick average, it's going to start the first part of the function for me. So in this example here, 
it said equals average and it opened up a bunch of parentheses for me. So all I had to do then was tell it where I wanted to find the average of. So what I did in this case is I started on cell E2. I clicked and dragged down to E22 so that they all highlighted in orange. And I told Google Sheets that I want to find the average of this range of cells. I could have typed this out as well. I could have done E22 colon, which stands for my range, E, sorry, E2 colon E22, and that would have told Google Sheets, I want to look at the average from cell E2 to E22. And it, Google Sheets would have known that. I personally find clicking and dragging to be a lot easier. So, and it's a lot more visual for me. So I just clicked on E2, held and dragged down to E22. And that's how, when I let go, it spit that in there for me for my average. And then again, you'll notice that little pop up giving me the calculation result before I even confirm this function. Once I'm happy with this function, I hit enter, the function runs, and I now have the average of my order total for this entire group of orders. So I didn't have to open up a calculator and say 90 plus, you know, 219 plus blah, 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 and then divide by however many. It just did it all that for me. So that's kind of a basic function. And the sum, the average, the count, the min, the max, they're all gonna work that way where Google Sheets will spit out the first part for you equals sum equals average, open up the parentheses, and then you just need to tell it what group of cells you wanna run that calculation on. And you can do that by clicking and highlighting. Now let's look at a more complicated function. So in this case here, in this example, I'm looking at column G, my item types, and I wanna count how many of those are panels. And you know, I could go in and I could look panel, panel, panel. I could hand count them. This isn't a super large group of data, so that might not be too hard for me. But once we start getting into the you know hundreds and thousands of records, that becomes a little bit more complicated. And I want a function that's going to count everything that says panel for me. So let's we're going to do another a more complicated function here. So we're going to walk through the same steps. The first thing I need to do is click on the cell I want to put the function in. So in this case here, and I went to the end of column G, and I think that's like G23 or G24. I clicked on that cell, and then I followed the steps that I just went through in the previous example. I went into insert, I went into function, and in this case, this count if function I'm looking for is buried in the math section, but I certainly could have gone to all and tried to find it in all. And then when I go into math here, all my math functions load up. And I don't even know what half of these do, so don't feel like you need to memorize all of these functions. I knew specifically that I was looking for a count if function because I know I wanted to count if a certain condition was met. If I kind of hover over that, you'll notice it expands out a little bit and it's going to tell me a little bit more about that function. So here it says a conditional count across the range. OK, that sounds like what I want. I want to count on the condition that it says panel across my range. OK, so I clicked on that and it started the function for me. So equals count if. The first step of the function here is I need to tell it what group of cells I'm counting on, just like we did with the average. Um, I needed to tell it what group of cells to take the average of. So here it wants my range, and I'll kind of let you, I, I kind of want to show you this. Google walks you through what you need to build your functions. Sometimes it's not always clear. You kind of need to take a deeper look, but this little pop up box here is going to walk you through what you need. So in this case here, it's first telling me I need the range because the range is bolded in green there. And then right below that, it's telling me here's an example of what this might look like. So in the example here, it says the range might be A1 through A10. That's not the range I want to use in this case. I want to use G2 through G22, but at least it gives me a sample of what that might look like. So I went in and I did exactly what I did for my average. I just clicked and dragged on the group of cells I wanted in my range. Or I could type it out if I knew for sure it was G2 through G22. G2 colon G22. And then once I'm finished with my range, I need to follow my example that I'm showing here. And I need to put a comma in to move on to the next step. We're moving on to the next step now. So here, count if, and here's my G2 through G22, comma. Now it's ready for the second piece of this formula, my criterion. And the criterion is going to be different, again, based on the function. And some functions are going to have more things that you need to put in. In this case here, we need a criterion. And so I'm trying to think what my criterion might be. So if I move 
into my example, I can see that they put quotations and they put greater than 20. So they're saying the criterion is they're quoting it and they're saying greater than 20. Okay, so that's probably gonna count if the value is greater than 20. So I'm gonna set up, I want it to be equal to, I don't want it to be greater than, I want it to be equal to the word panel. So in my example here, I did quotations because I'm kind of copying what they're doing here. I saw they put quotations and I said quotations equals and then panel. That's so me telling Google Sheets, I want to count across this range if my criterion is met. My criterion here is that the text there says panel. And then once I'm happy, I hit enter and I will run that formula to see if it was successful. And again, this is just reminding you that Google Sheets does walk you through this example here. So this is my result of my count if formula. It gave me a result of eight and I can sell that, see that in cell G23. I get a result of eight, meaning that there are eight items listed as panel in the range that I specified. If I'm not sure that this formula turned out right or returned the right result, I can always go back and look at that formula again. All I have to do is click on the cell and the formula is going to load up in the address bar so I can see that when I click on eight here, here's what it took to get me to eight. I set up equals count if the range comma equals and then panel and that's what got me to eight. So my formula was successful. There's eight items listed as panel. Now, Google Sheets is really literal. If somebody went in and misspelled panel to panel or they add on an extra L, it's not going to count that. Um, so that's just one thing to be mindful of is be really clear with your spelling or you might want to set up data validation, which we can talk about in another webinar. Um, but this will at least give you anything that's panel spelled correctly. So that's a little bit about functions. Functions are a little bit overwhelming. Um, they have so many different pieces to them. So kind of my recommendation is definitely look very carefully at the example Google is providing you and try and kind of learn about that. It's always going to highlight in green what you actively need to input. It's always going to give you an example. And so take that and use that to build your function as much as possible. Um, and as a reminder, a lot of the Excel functions you're used to using if you are coming from Excel do work in Google and they're going to be built the same way. Just your examples might look a little bit different. All right, so we're going to shift topics now into sorting. So sorting is just a way to group your data um, and sort your data by certain criteria. So let's look at this example here. In my example here, I want to sort by date. I want all my purchase orders in the order of the date that they came in. And I can see right now they're all jumbled. That could be because somebody sorted on something different. Um, that could also be because, you know, we're crazy busy and we're just entering orders when we can, but maybe we have a backlog we're working through. Who knows why a data gets entered disorganized, but it happens, we're human. So in order to sort this in the format that I want, I first wanna click on the, a cell, any cell, in the column that I want to sort. So in this case, I clicked on cell A2, but I could, click, could have clicked on A9 or A13 as long as I was in the A column because I want to sort based on the A column. Once I'm in the column I want to sort on, I click, so I clicked on the cell here, I click on data, and then I pick sort sheet by, and then I double check my column here, sort sheet by column A, Okay, column A is what I want. And then do I want to sort smallest to greatest, A to Z, or do I want to reverse sort Z to A? In this case, I'm going to do A to Z to sort them from the beginning of the month to the end of the month. And just always double check you are sorting on the right column. And then what this will do for you is it will readjust all of the rows as well. So it's not just column A that's getting sorted, it's the whole sheet. So it keeps the row information together. Let's take a look at the result here. So here's my sheet before I did the sort. I clicked on my column A. I did sort sheet A to Z. And then this is my end result here. So if we do a quick comparison, I can see that my dates are now all in order. And the rest of that information is not going to be in order because it kept the rows together. So if I look at my top row there in my before 3-4 and my item SKU starts 619, if I go find that now in 
here we can see that it kept that data together. So my rows are kept together. It just reorders it based on the column that I told it to reorder it on. So that's what sorting does is it puts data in an order for you. Um, Google Sheets does not have layered sorting like Excel does. So you can sort on one column at a time, um, but there's unfortunately not a way to sort on multiple columns at a time. Unless Angela knows something different, but as far as I can I have been able to find, you can just do one sort at a time. In addition to sorting, let's talk about filtering. So filtering is a way for you to selectively look at certain data at a certain time. Once we get into really large data sheets, we might have an overwhelming amount of data and I might just need to look at certain dates, certain times, certain grade levels. So I can filter that information out. Filters are nice because they don't delete any information. They just hide it so that I only see the information I need to see. So in Google Sheets, the first thing we have to do is we have to set up a filter. So to set up a filter, I click anywhere in my data set. So I do have to be within the data set. If I click on an empty cell, uh, Google Sheets doesn't know what to filter. So I do need to click on any cell in my data set. It doesn't matter which one, as long as it contains numbers or data and it's part of my larger set. Once I click on that cell, I come up to the data menu here. And in this case, we looked at data already to do our sorting. In this case, it's sorted. I just now need to filter. So I can click on create a filter. What that does is it very slightly changes my view. So what it does is all my filtered columns are now going to have a light green tint to them, as seen up here, up at the top. I've got this light green tint here and a light green tint on my rows. It's not on my actual cells. It's just on the labels there. And then each of my header pieces got a little down arrow that will let me know I can filter based on that condition. So to use the filter, I click on that little arrow on a particular column and I'm now filtering on that column. And I have several different filter options. So the first one is I can then sort A to Z. So I could sort my column A on A to Z. We already did that, so I'm not gonna worry about this piece here, but I can also do sorting right from within filtering. And you'll notice I can also sort by color. So if I do some sort of conditional formatting, I can sort my colors as well. Below that are some different filter options. I can filter by condition and conditions could be um, anything. They could be date is today, date is before yesterday, um, number is greater than this, number is less than this. There's a lot of different conditions, but essentially you click filter by condition or filter by color and you pick the condition or color you want to filter on. And then finally, you can just select and deselect different values here. So I can use my blue select all to select everything and have it all visible. Or I can clear this out and I can just select certain dates to filter on. And then once I have my filter set to go, I click OK and my filter is now applied. What does that look like? How do I know I have a filter applied? So there's some different th ways you can know that you have a filter applied. The first way is look for the filter icon. When your data is filtered by a certain column, that column down arrow is going to change from that little lined down arrow to a filter. That indicates that you are actively filtering based on that column there. So that's your very first indication that you're filtering. The other indication that you're filtering is you might have missing rows. Again, the reason for that is, is this information isn't gone. It's just hidden from view. So I can see in this example here, I jump from row one to row nine, and then it goes 10, 11, 12, 13, and then 14, 15, 16, and 17 are all missing, and it jumps to 18, 19, and then we jump from 19 to 23. So because my row numbers are jumping around like that, that lets me know also that there's some missing information here. Or let's not call it missing, let's call it hidden information. There's some information that is being filtered out from my current view, and that's because I told the sheet I only wanted to see March 2nd and March 5th, so the rest of my dates are no longer visible. You can always come in here and you can always reset that filter. So you can come back into that little drop down and you can click select all to restore all your information. Uh, but you might need to get rid of the filter for some other reason. 
Maybe you added new information that's not being grabbed by the filter. Maybe you just want to start over, you filter too much. You can turn the filter off at any point as well. To turn the filter off, you come into the same data menu we went into to turn it on. Again, make sure you're selected on somewhere in that data. Um, I'm here on cell A1, so I'm in that data. I click data and I click turn off the filter and that will turn off the filter for me and that will kind of reset my sheet to its state before. It'll bring back all of those hidden rows and the filter's gone, so I can't, I have to turn it back on to filter again, but then all my data is restored and nothing is hidden from you anymore. I like filters, they're easy to use. Um, they're a good way, like I said, to hide information that you don't wanna see, so you just look at information you do wanna see. Moving on to the next topic, um, we're going to talk a little bit about charts and then I believe we'll talk we'll very briefly review sharing and we're going to wrap up. So the final thing we want to look at is adding visual charts to our data. So adding a chart is relatively simple to add a chart. The first thing that you want to do is you want to decide what data set you want to make a chart about. It could be a single column. It could be multiple columns. It's up to you. But what you want to do is first click and drag and highlight all of the cells you want to make a chart of. So in this case here, I highlighted my order total. Once I have my cells highlighted, I can come into the insert menu and I can click chart to add a chart relevant to the cells that I just highlighted. That is going to put a chart in for me. The chart's going to pop in right there over my data. It, I can move it. It's not a big deal. And then this chart editor pane is going to pop up here where I can make some changes to my chart. So the first thing I might want to change is I might want to change the chart type. Google tries to pick the best chart for the job. In this case, it picked a line um, so I could kind of see my trend line over time. However, that might not be the most user friendly. I might need a bar graph. You know, I might need a scatter plot um, so I can come in here and I can change the chart type. Additionally, maybe I realized that I missed some of the data I needed to include. So I could always come back in here and expand the data range. I can click it here and I can manually type it out E2 through E23 or E24. Um, or I can click on that little grid icon there at the very end of that line to click and drag and repick my data. In this case here, I only have one group of data. I don't have any X axis information, so I could come in here and I could add some additional information. Um, we're going to kind of gloss over that. You don't need to worry about that too much there. And then I could add additional series of data too. So let's say I have these are my order totals for March. Maybe I have another set of order totals for April. I could come in and I could add those as well. I would just click add series and I would add the additional date range I wanted to, or sorry, the additional cell range I wanted to include. So let's say April was, you know, we'll keep it going on down. It'll be in the same column, but let's say April was cells E44 through E55. I would come in here and I could add that series as well, and that would add a second line for me. I have some additional check boxes here as far as just different. I could switch my rows and columns. I could switch what I'm using as my headers. I could switch my column labels um, so I can just check on and off these different boxes to just give some more context to my chart. If you're not totally sure what all of these do, you can't really mess up a chart because all you do is just delete it when you're done with it. So definitely feel free to play around with these and see what, you know, changing the chart type does, see what adding these different labels do. And then finally, there is an option to customize your chart as well. So maybe I like this chart, but I want to change the visuals up just a little bit. I can click where my number six just popped up there. I can go into customize and I can change things like the color. You know, I could change some of the increments listed there so I can really drill down even further into my chart and really customize it to how I want it to look. So that's the chart editor. What about the chart itself? It popped in over my data. It might be way too big for what I need. I need to just get rid of it completely. How do I handle the chart itself? So it's really easy to handle the chart itself. It becomes a movable object on your sheet. So all you have to do is click on the chart so that those blue lines with the handle show up around it. And then you can click on the edge of that chart or somewhere in the white space of that chart and click and hold and drag it to a different place on your sheet. So it's not on top of your data. You can click and drag it down below your data and so that it's not in the way. If it's 
really big because sometimes these charts come in really big. I can use the little corner handles to adjust the size of the chart. I just click and drag on those corner handles and that will make it bigger if I drag out and smaller if I drag in. And then additionally, I can drill down even within this chart to make some customizations. So in this example here, I clicked on my little gray lines. I can click on any of those elements to customize them as well. I could change the color of these lines. I could change the frequency of these lines. So any element of a chart I want to really fine tune, I can click on that as well. And then finally, um, I didn't include this in my slide deck because it kind of is occurring to me right now, but every chart here is going to have these vertical ellipses. These are more options. If you want to export this chart as a picture or you want to do some additional things with this chart, you can click these three dots here and you get some more options for the chart. Um, one of them being save the chart as a picture and you'll have a picture of this chart saved to your desktop somewhere. And then finally, when I'm clicked on a chart like this, so it has the blue outline around it, I can tap delete on my keyboard and that will delete the chart entirely for me. So if you made a mistake, you overly customize it, you don't know how to fix it, delete the chart and just start the process over again. All right, home stretch. Um, if you've attended any other Google webinar, you're familiar with sharing by now. I just want to remind you of how to share this so you can collaborate live with somebody. Because again, for me, the magic in Google is the sharing and the live collaboration features. So to share your beautiful work with somebody else, they can work on it with you. Um, just a quick reminder that the sharing does mean working collaboratively together on the same document, not multiple versions of a document. So let's review really quickly how we share. So always in the top right hand corner is that big green share button. And if I have some specific people in mind, I can click on that share button there. And in the pop up box there, I can type out the name of anybody in the district I want to share it to. This is connected to our district directory, so I just have to know their name. Um, I type it in and it will go to them. If I want to share with somebody outside of our district, I need their full email address um, and I need to know they have a Google account. So anyone with a Google account I can share with, I just type in that full email as opposed to just their name. Once I decide who I want to share with, I can decide what level of permission I'm giving them. Whether I'm giving them edit permission or viewing permission, I just click that little pencil box there to change their level of permission. I can add an optional note and that will go into the email they get. And then I click send and then this will go to them. They will get an email notifying them of their access and they will also be able to access this from their Google Drive directly. If instead, I want to generate a share link to copy paste in an email. I can also do that. I again come up to the share button. And in the pop up though, instead of typing in the names of people, I click on the tiny little link there that says get shareable link. In the little pop up that generates there, I can then choose this drop down to pick what level of access I want to give and to whom. So maybe I want anyone at Modesto City to be able to view this. I pick that drop down and I pick that. Once I have that level of access picked, I can then click copy link. That link is then copied to my clipboard and I can go paste that anywhere I like. I can put that in Schoology, I can paste it in an email, I can paste it in a Word document. Wherever I want to paste that, I can now paste that. And then I send it off to whoever needs it. They can click on the link and they'll be given whatever permission I set up with the link. So in this example here, anyone who clicks on my link from Modesto City Schools will be able to view this document. They won't be able to edit it because I did not make this an edit link. All right, that was a lot of information in 45 minutes, so I'm anticipating some questions. Um, feel free to post those in the chat or at this point, if you want to come off mute, feel free to unmute and ask your questions that way as well. I have also posted the attendance link there in the chat for you. So please take a moment to fill that out. Uh, that's how you'll get credit for the hour that we just spent together.
to just look through the chat. It looked like there was no other questions that came in other than a couple people were having some audio issues, so I apologize for that. Um, I'm happy to hang out. I'll hang out in the call just in case there are any questions that come in. Like I said, feel free to unmute and ask them out loud or post them there in the chat. And then please do make sure you fill out that webinar attendance link um, so that I get a copy of that. And then, yes, I will be emailing you a copy of this presentation. Um, I will also be emailing you a copy of the recording of the presentation I just did.